there are a lot of archival Japanese brands that weird skinny white dudes go crazy over, all right? And if you want to know about the history of Comme des Garçons, that is absurdly easy to do with a quick Google search. But if you want to know about Beauty Beast, what do you even do? You, you, you look like a crazy person like Charlie Kelly from Always Sunny with the, the strings connecting pictures of histories and designers and influences. So today we're, we're going to do that. We're going to become full on Japanese archive conspiracy theorists and look at some of the great, great, more underground Japanese archival brands. We have pieces from LGB, If Six Was Nine, Undercover, Number Nine, and Beauty Beast. We're going to be looking at each of them and talking a little bit about each of those brands because God knows they're hard to find good information about. So let's dive in. All right, I am here with my pointer microphone to break down these archival Japanese brands for you with my microphone. So first we are starting with the brand Undercover. Why are we starting with Undercover? Because it's the most relatable to a Western fashion connoisseur. It is much more digestible and understandable, I would say. The brand was founded by Jun Takahashi, okay? Uh, an early collaborator with Nigo, who did A Bathing Ape, and is now with uh, Human Maid, Kenzo, etc. They formed the Nowhere Company. But why do I say they are more understandable to a Western audience? Well, Undercover, it's got similarities to more Western brands like Raph Simmons, right? You could even say uh, an American brand like Helmet Lang. There's these workwear elements uh, imbued with a punk sense. And there's also a high fashion kind of vibe to it. Like even now, Undercover is doing fashion shows where they've got like butterflies and people's skirts and whatnot. You know what I mean? That's not something that a lot of these other Japanese streetwear type brands would do. But Undercover is an interesting one because they are equally streetwear as well as luxury. They do the runway shows. They have the crazy high fashion, tailored craftsmanship type stuff. But then they've got straight up graphic t-shirts like a Supreme or something like that. But the great thing for an archivist in training is that most of the undercover pieces throughout the decades that they've been around are very affordable. There's just a key set of archival collections from undercover that people go nuts over and are really, really expensive. But for the most part, you can get into undercover very affordably and very accessibly. All right, undercover, iconic brand, really, I think, easy to get into and easy to understand from a, a Western fashion lover's point of view. And these pants are a perfect example of that. This is a gray, very dark gray pair of skinny jeans. Uh, you'll see the sizing later. They're size two, made in Japan. And these are a Joy Division reference right here based on the song Atmosphere. And they've got these patches, walk in silence. They're, they're kind of flipped, like don't walk away, in silence, back and forth like that, endless talking, all these different fonts. And I think these ones are a really good one to throw in because they're a great entry point into Japanese fashion. A pair of pants like these would fit in really well to any closet featuring a bunch of Raph Simmons, another brand that is heavily featured Joy Division in the past. Due to the patching and the, the font style and things like that, uh, if you were a person who was heavily into something like Vetements, I think th these would also fit incredibly well into your closet. So even though there's a lot going on, kind of like punk vibes, I think they're, they're very approachable. The detailing is really nice. The patches, I love the look, the frayed look that they've got to them. The hardware is branded. Got a nice little hook for a, for a carabiner, a wallet chain, something like that. I love little additions like this. I think Japanese brands are really good at this detailing. And another thing I like, the back is just as wild as the front. I feel like sometimes brands, they, they neglect the back side of their garments, but this is even more embellished than the front, I would say. It was $1,200 at retail, honestly crazy, but their stuff tends to be very, very affordable at resale. Like these, you would not be paying $1,200 now if you were to buy them. And unless you're looking for something from one of their absolute most iconic collections, which they do have their collectors and that stuff gets crazy for the grails. But for the most part, 
undercover stuff is quite accessible from a price perspective. Made in Japan, size 2, cotton poly blend, so a little bit of stretch to it, which is important because they are very skinny. So these ones definitely, obviously, very Western influence, taking that new wave, punk, gothic aesthetic, but then applying it and twisting it in that classic Japanese streetwear kind of way. All right, next up, we are going to be talking about the brand Number 9. Number 9 is a punk-inspired label. This is, uh, there's definitely some similarities to Undercover, but I would say it is a little bit less high fashion, a little bit more uh, workmanlike, and a little bit more like 90s rock and roll. So the brand was founded by Takahiro Miyashita, okay? And Miyashita, they got uh, the brand name from, obviously, the Beatles song Revolution 9, Number 9. Nine, number nine, et cetera, et cetera. So already there's a rock and roll element being imbued into the brand, but there's also heavy punk rock vibes, as well as especially grunge, like 90s grunge, Kurt Cobain, fuzzy sweater vibes are all over the history of this brand, which spanned about a 10 year period from the late 90s to the late 2000s. Uh, actually, Takahiro Miyashita is still designing to this day is just under the brand Takahiro Miyashita, the soloist, which still has some of those rock and roll elements, but I feel like is a bit more classically high fashion in a lot of ways. So number nine, what I love about it is that it's taking these Western, uh, both American and British rock and roll and punk kind of looks and twisting them in this Japanese way. This right here is the cargo thermal zip-up hoodie from number nine. And this is a fairly unassuming piece, I would say. It's got some very light elements of design that just take it over the top. But one of my favorite parts is just the feel. It's so soft. It's some of the best cotton I've ever felt. And it's also lined in this thermal right here. So it makes it just a absolute dream to wear. Obviously, these cargo pockets are like the main element that sets it apart from your typical hoodie. But this one, I think, really heavily and effectively leans into the grunge vibe that Takahiro Miyashita, the founder of Number 9, was so into. And I think you can definitely see the punk in there. But I love that this brand, it has more associations even with just straight up rock and roll and grunge. So harking back to a slightly earlier era than the 2000s punk that came later. These pockets here, I find incredibly interesting. Like he wasn't content to just leave it at these cargo pockets. Look at how this stitch goes across and then turns upwards, curling them in, giving them each this really unique shape. There's a lot of thought that was put into this. The contrasting black drawstrings are great. Metal Riri zipper, you love to see it. And then you can also see how it kind of curls in on itself, uh, an almost organic type of feel that I think was actually kind of rare for the brand. Like this almost has Yeezy vibes, Yeezy season in some ways. Obviously the, the Yeezy season vibes were, were coming from this and not the other way around. You can see the tag here, it is number nine by Takahiro Miyashita. This is 100% cotton. Again, the fabrication is some of my favorite I've ever felt. Uh, size three, so we'll definitely be paying attention to that sizing. And made in Japan. Always super important for me in these pieces that they are actually authentically Japanese. I think that adds an extra layer. Huge fan of this piece. I think it's one of the most accessible ways to get into the brand, and the feel is just so good. Next, we are going to talk about Beauty Beast, founded by Takao Yamashita. And Beauty Beast is probably the hardest of this entire bunch to categorize because they were the most wide ranging and honestly kind of odd label of the bunch that we're talking about right now. So Beauty Beast definitely has the similar kind of punk elements that you've seen in the brands we've talked about so far but there's also a lot more going on there. So at a base level, it is influenced by Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren. They had Seditionaries, which a lot of these Japanese brands were heavily influenced by. But then I think Beauty Beast, maybe more than any of these others, brought in Japanese influences more than the rest. So there's like fairy tale elements, kind of exaggerated weirdo stuff that feels very uniquely Japanese, but if you want a Western reference, maybe like Walter Van Berendonck in some ways, but even that doesn't really fully capture it. 
Also, you've got some very interesting Japanese, like Harajuku type stuff. You've got anime influences going on, manga, I don't know. It's not my area, okay? Don't crucify me for that. You've also got a weird kind of like um, sexualized stuff in a way. The fits were tight in a lot of ways. I can see some similarities to modern labels like Ambush in some ways. And overall, this is just a weird, weird, but incredibly interesting brand. Maybe the most interesting of the entire bunch in terms of what there is to dive into in their archive and the kind of unique, weird stuff that you can find that Beauty Beast made. Like, we're gonna look at one piece in a second, but that piece is very different from many other Beauty Beast pieces you could find because the influences and the interests of the creator were so varied. So it's, it's just such a weird little archival brand. People, I, I think, don't talk about it enough because there's some really interesting stuff happening here. Beauty Beast, what an interesting brand and one of the most esoteric uh, of the archival Japanese brands to get into, I think. They're definitely far less easily understandable than something like Undercover, I would say, but there are actually quite a few similarities. First of all, you can definitely see the punk influence coming in. Like for all intents and purposes, this is a bondage jacket with these leather straps going across. But this kind of like frayed wool fabrication, the brown leather, it gives it an almost, I don't know, humble sort of creation here. And that's because I think the one thing that sets Beauty Beast apart is that they're also taking these kind of fairy tale esque um, old English or like almost pilgrim esque vibes and applying them to Japanese streetwear. These straps, of course, are absolutely insane and look really good when they're all done up, but this is just a beautiful kind of plum brown wool jacket here. It is listed there as ready-made, and I have seen people call these pieces like a collaboration with the Japanese brand ready-made, but I believe that there's no similarity here between them whatsoever. It completely stands on its own. They just called this a ready-made piece. A Beauty Beast original limited edition uh, stock code product of more than one country of origin, so not just made in Japan on this one. This brand dates back to the 90s, uh, a bit older than some of the other archival brands that people get really into. And this is a brand that also has a bunch of different uh, directions that you could go in. Like some of the Bambi pieces have a very like 90s Y2K street style Harajuku kind of vibe. Whereas pieces like this one, I think lean into the more punk side, but then you've also got these wild like multi-toe shoes that again, feel like a, a fairy tale. But this one was perfect for me, a punk at heart, a punk turned fashion connoisseur. Um, also the, the entire jacket is just great. These chunky metal zippers at the sleeves that go way, way, way up. I just see a lot of potential in this piece. All right, so this section is where things are going to get the most crazy conspiratorial connecting the dots weirdo, okay? Because this is one of the deepest pieces of archival Japanese fashion history, and that is the collection of brands and shops that make up Maniac Corp. We're gonna be talking about two of them today, okay? So there's Maniac Corp, and under Maniac Corp, they've got various shops and brands, uh, probably the two biggest of which are LGB, which is Le Grand Bleu, very French, right? And then you've also got If Six Was Nine, and we have a piece from each of those here today. Let's start off by talking about LGB because I feel like that's more accessible to me and probably a lot of the viewers here. So LGB, is the most classically uh, punk inspired out of the bunch. I think you can draw a direct line from Seditionaries back to LGB and then to the greater Maniac Corp, right? So LGB, lots of zippers, elongated silhouettes, leathers, things like that. It's just punk through and through, but always twisted through this Japanese fashion deconstructionist aesthetic. So. There's LGB, but under Maniac Corp, there is also If Six Was Nine. And If Six Was Nine is actually maybe even more interesting if a little bit less relatable to me. So If Six Was Nine is the bohemian kind of label. There's definitely punk elements, absolutely. Like you'll see skull buttons and stuff like that, but really it's like a boho 
kind of uh, 60s rock and roll Jefferson airplane type of vibe, like literally, and I mean this literally, it is the stuff you would see uh, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith wearing on the regular. You've got like flared pants, big flowy silk organza type stuff, very feminine. It may even be genderless actually. Like the, the fits are really unique. It's very flowing, very drapey, very natural, organic. It's a very odd label, but really interesting. And the craftsmanship is just insane. And they don't have labels at the neck. Instead, they've got these like snakeskin patches. And that's how you know it is a piece by If Six Was Nine. I mean, you can check on the care tags too, and that's there. But this whole family, right? Maniac Corp, LGB, uh, If Six Was Nine. It's this crazy umbrella of Americana that is taken by these Japanese brands and twisted and recontextualized in really cool ways. And I think overall, if there's one thing you can take from this video, it's that most of these Japanese brands, they're doing stuff that will probably be familiar to you as a Western fashion connoisseur, but they are twisting it and making it their own in ways that make it very singular in its aesthetic. And a lot of those aesthetics match up very well with my own. All right. If six was nine, the Bohemian vibes are strong with this one. The Steven Tyler Aerosmith is just trying to take over my soul with this piece right now. The detailing is actually wild though. Like if you look at these collars, they've got a really interesting shape and they're also striped right here. And then all of this stitch detailing in gold is crazy. And when you look to the inside of that, so this is the outside, interestingly enough, then at the inside, sequins, golden sequins. And that's where the, the color of these stitches is coming from. What a weird, interesting choice that is. And then it like ties off right here, if you want it to, crazy. And then these upturned cuffs and the buttons are actually maybe the craziest part of the entire thing. So they're covered like in this kind of fabric, but that's a skull, y'all, a metal skull. And inside the eyes are these like crystals or rhinestones or something. Like they're chunky too, they're weighty and heavy. That's one of the wildest things I've seen on a piece in a long time. And that's all of the buttons going down this piece. Insane. The fabrication is crazy. You can see it is a little bit sheer. And that's because this is cotton and silk, as you can see. And these come from Maniac Corp. Uh, we'll talk more about them in just a moment, but they're very important and influential in the annals of uh, Japanese street archival fashion. And of course, made in Japan. And the back is kept very simple, but most importantly, up at the top of the neck, you're gonna see this strip right here, which is the only really recognizable brand marking that they put on their pieces. There's no tag inside the neck. So what you get on if six was nine pieces is this strip of snake skin across the back of the neck. And that's kind of like the Margella for stitches or something like that, where you see it and it's instantly recognizable and known as if six was nine. And finally, here is a piece from LGB, which stands for Le Grand Bleu. And this is like a sister brand to um, If Six Was Nine. They're both under the Maniac Umbrella Corporation. And If Six Was Nine is the Bohemian vibe, whereas this is the more rocker brand. And I think that's, that's kind of obvious from the style in comparison, right? But this like check plaid flannel shirt from them is absolutely insane. Look at this treatment, this worn bleached-ish kind of like acid wash treatment that it's got going on here. I find that incredibly interesting. These kind of like Western shaped snap pockets with metal snaps, great choice. And metal YKK zippers going across at a diagonal at the chest. And I think looking at this, it really plays into the kind of like seditionaries punk vibes that have been so popular in Japanese street fashion for decades now. You've got these frayed patched shoulders in this contrasting plaid. And you get that at the cuffs as well, which comes up in this really interesting shape and snap buttons going all the way up there. 
there's just some, there's some choices being made in this piece that are just wild. And maybe the coolest part is this collar right here. You may notice, I'm not sure how much it shows up on camera. This is a massive, massive collar to this piece. And maybe the craziest part of all is that it's removable. You could snap this right off and suddenly it becomes a mandarin collar. You could just toss this giant collar off to the side and be left with a mandarin collar, which I think is likely to be a really good look. LGB stuff does get a tag at the neck, unlike if six was nine. And we can see that this one is all con, which is, you know, really no surprises there. Once again, at Maniac Corp, much like that if six was nine shirt, again, same parent company. And just to confirm, yes, it is made in Japan. So from a design perspective, I mean, love it or hate it, but I think this is actually the most interesting piece from a fashion perspective of the entire bunch we're looking at today. All right, we're just gonna kind of throw fits together with these, try these on. I don't know how well any given one is gonna work together. Some will probably work better than others, but we only have one pair of pants here and it is the undercover patched Joy Division jeans. So let's get those on first. Putting them on, I love the fit and I love the feel. They're a, a low rise, very, very skinny, kind of old school, mid 2000s style, perfect for a boomer punk like myself, loving my skinny jeans forever and always. And the length is great too. Like for some people, they would probably be pretty short, like too short, but they, they land in the perfect spot for me. We don't have any shoes on showcase from any of these Japanese archive brands. So we'll just throw on some Rick Owens abstract Ramones. Rick tends to go with lots of things, especially more like rock and roll oriented stuff, punk oriented stuff like these Japanese pieces are. I think it'll work great. And for tops, let's first try on the If Six Was Nine silk shirt. First off, I will say this thing is tiny and it may even be women's wear. Uh, I wanted to try an If Six Was Nine top, so I grabbed this one. It is very cool, as you saw, but it is too small for me. It just is. Uh, this isn't probably something I'm going to keep in the rotation, but I'm super happy to be trying it out. Of course, with that fabrication, the feel of it is great, and I can absolutely see why people like this. It's not entirely my vibe, but wearing it open like this, it has a really, really nice look. I think the cut is great. I could totally see somebody with that, that kind of earthy look and aesthetic wearing this as an overshirt over a t-shirt or something like it's got a vibe and I, I think I understand it and I appreciate it for what it is. Next up, let's switch it out for its sister brand, this um, red shirt from LGB. Le Grand Bleu. And this one is much more up my alley. The length is sick. I love how far it goes down. It's long, it's skinny. It's, it's the right vibe for me. And this one is great. The, the flannel fabrication feels incredible. It feels well-made. I love the snap buttons for a closure. Just easier in my opinion. And the look is really good. It's a lot. That big collar uh, may not be everybody's cup of tea, but I really like the fringe distressed elements. It's very like old school Vivian Westwood Anglomania in a way. And once you take the collar off, I think this works even more. Uh, the, the original collar was a bit cartoonish for my taste, but leaving it as the open Mandarin collar lets that, that long skinny cut really come to the forefront. And I think I would definitely wear this regularly. But now we got to get into some of the outerwear. So we're going to have to switch out this button down shirt. And instead, we will throw on a silk t-shirt from Takahiro Miyashita, the soloist, which is the brand that uh, he, he left number nine and then did the soloist. So it's his more recent brand and this shirt's great. So speaking of Takahiro Miyashita, let's do that cargo pocket zip up hoodie. I wasn't even necessarily planning this, but this goes great with the undercover jeans. And as I mentioned in the close-up details look, the fabrication of this piece is some of my favorite I've ever felt. It is a dream to wear this hoodie. The thermal inside the hood feels great, 
but even the outside, the cotton they use, it's this soft, soft kind of open type of cotton that you really don't feel anymore. It's something that I remember more from like my childhood. Stuff used to feel like this more often, I feel, but it seems like things have gotten a bit more mass produced, a bit more stiff and harsh, but this feels perfectly broken in and soft. Of course, the look is great. It's a little bit slouchy, a little bit 90s rock and roll. And the cargo pockets make it very modern. Like this would fit really well into the closet of somebody who's a big Rick Owens fan, um, Balenciaga fan, I think. Even like uh, J.W. Anderson have some pieces that maybe not in this color palette, but this kind of like design aesthetic. So this one is maybe the biggest winner for me so far, but we still have to try on the Beauty Beast wool jacket, the bondage strap jacket. This one was a flyer for me. I was not sure how much I would like it or even how it would fit, all of this stuff, but I am incredibly impressed. I think this is one of those things that you could wear every day throughout the fall and into the winter, and it would work with a wide variety of looks. The wool itself, there is some plum, some red in there, but also some brown. So I think the color combinations could work with a bunch of different pieces. And of course, those brown leather straps, they give it a, a kind of like harshness and a naturality that I really like. The sleeves kind of flare out in a nice way. Of course, both the cuffs and the hem are left raw and fringed. And you've got these big chunky zippers throughout and the hardware on the straps, all that little bits of metal uh, really help out as well. So this one I think could be worn by itself, but also with the number nine hoodie underneath it, the color palette is working in all sorts of ways here, this earthy palette. So this one, I wasn't sure what to expect, but again, I think it's gonna fit really well into my closet. And in a way, like I don't have anything else that looks like this. So having this, I think will do a lot of heavy lifting for me in filling some gaps of what I would normally be wearing. So in all, all of these pieces have something really interesting to offer. And I feel like by getting a close up look at them and then trying them on, seeing how they feel, how they fit, has given me a much better idea of what is valuable in these archive Japanese brands and why people still feel so attached to them and really spend lots of time scouring the web and searching for them and collecting them. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to be found in these and I think the aesthetics, especially like Western rock and roll, grunge, punk aesthetics, uh, really speak to me and are on my level and within my aesthetic. So I'm definitely gonna be taking a closer look at all of these brands in the future. I, I feel like I've found a lot of new favorites. All right, that's the video. Thank you so much for watching it. Take a look at the other video on screen here. Subscribe to my channel, like this video, and I'll see you next time.